And so you're practicing bringing the uh, top-down control of thoughts and feelings along with awareness of your heart and breathing along with actual literal physical controlled slow breathing that that's as that's effective discovering who you really are can be the most exciting adventure of your life if you have the courage to look deep within face your fears and overcome your self-limiting beliefs welcome to the most exciting adventure of your life welcome to a new way of living and welcome to the fierce planet adventures podcast Hi, I'm Casey. And I'm Andy. And we're on a mission to inspire and guide 1 million people to live a life of purpose, passion, and self-mastery, leveraging the five mountains of cutting-edge human development to build extreme mental fitness. Today, we are speaking with Dr. Ginsberg. He earned a BS in biology, cum laude, from Yale University, MA in anthropology from Brandeis University, MA in psychology from Boston College, and PhD in clinical neuropsychology from the University of Memphis, Tennessee. Presently, he is a licensed clinical psychologist, neuropsychologist in South Carolina after retiring from the Columbia, South Carolina VA hospital in 2019. He's currently adjunct faculty at Saybrook University and Research Associate Professor at the University of South Carolina School of Medicine. Dr. Ginsberg has been a principal investigator, co-PI, or co-investigator on research grants from the DOD, VA, and NIH studying heart rate variability and HRV biofeedback in patients with either chronic pain or PTSD. Currently, he's collaborating with researchers at Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine, Duke University School of Medicine, and University of South Carolina School of Medicine on grant proposals under review by NIH and DOD to study heart rate variability and heart rate variability biofeedback. Dr. Ginsberg has advocated for integrative management of chronic pain and PTSD using autonomic self-regulation as a self-empowering mind-body treatment for the past 15 or more years. He authored or co-authored more than 70 peer-reviewed scientific publications, chapters, and abstracts, served as a scientific reviewer of research grant proposals for NIH, the VA, and the DOD, and edited or reviewed numerous published scientific articles. In addition, Dr. Ginsberg has given invited presentations on HRV and HRVB at scientific meetings, academic seminars, and webinars. He was also program co-chair of the Association for Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback Special 50th Anniversary Annual Scientific Meeting in Denver, Colorado. Welcome, Dr. Ginsberg. Well, thank you, Casey and Andrew. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much for uh, hosting me. Absolutely. We're very happy to have you to talk about a very, very interesting and important topic. Um, and that is heart rate variability. Um, but before we get into that, we've got an opening question for you. What are you most excited about in your life right now? Oh, having um, a little different perspective on time management. Uh, at my stage of professional career, I'm able now to self-direct and uh, use my time with much more freedom than ever before. And so now I have time to pursue interests that I have and I have a little bit of relaxation even. Uh, that's, that's the best thing in my life right now. Oh, that's a great place to Fantastic. be. Um, well, let's kick it off. Heart rate variability, HRV. What is it? Well, uh, that's a wonderful question, and I'm glad you asked it. Uh, we think of heart rate, it, it's just pulses, it just beats. By definition, in a simple but strict physical definition, heart rate is just something over time, whether it's distance or uh, frequency of something. It's just over time. In order to measure heart rate, then we have to have some unit of time. Typically, beats per minute. HR is reported typically in beats per minute. A normal heart rate is 60 beats per minute. 
<clears throat> now here's where the interesting part comes in. Heart rate variability is not heart rate. Let's take our example of 60 beats per minute. Well, there are several, but I'm only going to talk about two ways of achieving a heart rate of 60 beats per minute. One would be each beat is separated by one second. And so you have 60 beats in 60 seconds. You would have a heart rate of 60 beats per minute with separation, or technically the interbeat interval would be equal at one second for all beats. Now, another way that you can achieve a 60 beat per minute heart rate would be if you had, let's say for example, uh, 30 beats uh, that were separated by 0.9 seconds and 30 beats that were separated by 1.1. When you average them over the 60 seconds, you'll get 60 beats per minute. But the units or the IBIs in between are not the same. The first case would have heart rate variability of zero. All of your IBIs are the same. Your heart would essentially be a metronome, tick, 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 units all the same. If you have variability in those interbeat intervals, you begin to have the makings of what we call heart rate variability. Now, here's the surprising thing. It's very, very important. It's foundational, really. Um, heart rate variability is good. A healthy heart is not a metronome and does not have equally spaced beats. A normal functioning heart is responsive to respiration. And in fact, there are slight but easily measurable differences in IBIs within the cardiac, within the respiratory cycle. So when you inhale, if you inhale and hold your, your uh, if, if you take five seconds to breathe in, your heart will accelerate slightly. The interbeat intervals will decrease, meaning the beats are closer together, and so your heart rate is faster. And that is measurable. When you exhale, your heart rate will slow down during the exhalation portion. And this is all due to uh, the homeostatic mechanisms controlling uh, blood flow circulation as it relates to respiration and any exertional or demands there might be on the heart. But in the normal resting state, if you are slow breathing, your heart rate will increase on your inhalation and it will decrease on the exhalation. That is critical. That's crucial to understanding heart rate variability. That's normal, that's healthy, that's good. A trained athlete, someone in excellent physical condition may have a change in heart rate. That's the uh, IBIs in the individual intervals corresponding to as much as I'm going to pull a number out of the air, but I'm going to say about 20 to 25 beats per minute change on acceleration and deceleration within a respiratory cycle. Well, that's a good thing. That's a healthy heart that is responding physiologically to changes going on homeostatically in terms of the brain, the baroreceptors in your, in your um, circulation, in your aorta, um, will sense the changes in heart rate and will send signals to central nervous system. Central nervous system sends signals back to heart, which will adjust the heart to account for these changes in acceleration and deceleration. That is necessary to maintain blood pressure homeostasis. If you didn't do that, then you'd be having these swings in blood pressure due to the acceleration and the deceleration. That's heart rate variability in a nutshell. Heart rate variability is the change in IBIs, which corresponds to heart rate, individual beats, the change in IBIs over respiratory cycle. And that's called RSA, respiratory sinus arrhythmia. It's normal and it's healthy. <clears throat> so the good news is that a, a healthy functioning heart that has no heart disease in an individual who is not overly burdened with stress or any medical conditions will exhibit this normal variation in heart rate over the, the respiratory cycle where you, you can measure, you can easily visualize increases in heart rate or acceleration on inhalation on a slow, deep breath 
And then a deceleration, the heart will slow down measurably in IBIs on acceleration. So when you and I do a cleansing breath, if I can increase your awareness through mindfulness and so on to the inf effects on your heart, you can become consciously aware of the effects of breathing on these very slight changes in your heart rate. That's, that's the, the approach to good physiological maintenance and self-care. Okay. Any other questions right now about the basis of heart rate variability? You know, um, just one, um, and this is, you know, <clears throat> I was in the hospital um, a little while back, I think last year uh, for a, a routine procedure, but one that was going to require me to go under anesthesia and pre-op, they had me hooked up to the monitors. And as part of my, when I was waiting, I was doing my breathing, breathing exercise. And I kept tripping the alarms on, on the monitor because I would do a long inhale and then a long exhale. Is that what you're talking about right here? Is, is that, that, that is what I'm talking about. Okay. And we're working on it. I mean, uh, this is um, being recognized and uh, there are, um, I'm going to say programs or protocols or procedures in surgical suites that I'm aware of where um, either slow, deep breathing or music or other uh, types of interventions that can improve the, um, the heart rate variability by slowing breath or by causing relaxation from central nervous system, what's called top down. You can achieve this with mind control, so to speak, or emotion regulation. But breathing is the, the fastest, most effective way to increase heart rate variability. When I think about energy and vitality, I think about a kid. They have the energy to play, run around, climb things. That energy that feels like you just can't contain yourself. It's the stuff we've always wished they could just bottle up and sell to us, right? Well, this company's found a way to do just that. Amari's Happy Juice Pack. Mood, motivation, energy, things our bodies can naturally produce when both our guts and our brains are happy and communicating. And we can actually improve that process of communication across the axis of the gut and the brain. This is cutting edge science. This is game changing information. This is where science meets soul. This is Amare. And we're helping people feel better naturally. Boost your serotonin and GABA. Balance your neurotransmitters. Nourish your gut. The things that make you want to do. Start feeling better the natural way. Check out the links in the show notes for discounts and more information. Wonderful. In, does age play a role in HRV and heart rate variability? And is there a target? Um, there are ranges uh, for different ages and different um, conditions. Let, we're just talking about normal, healthy populations now. Mm -hmm. And uh, to answer your question about age, um, clearly there is a decline in normal heart rate variability with age. So if, if when I was uh, 30 years old, if I was in good health, uh, my heart rate variability may have been at a certain level. And there are numerous, many, many quantitative measures. I mean, almost too many, but... There are lots and lots of ways of measuring heart, or extracting uh, data from a series of IBIs or pulses. But one of them is to look at the max men over a respiratory cycle. And you can achieve that very simply. So if, if I was under carefully controlled conditions, I was in good health and I was about 30 years old <coughs> or younger, let's say, um, I might have had a heart rate variability max men of let's say 12 or 15, which is sort of normal for someone who's not highly trained. Nowadays, if I did the same test, the same protocol at my age, which is a little older than that, uh, I'm actually 70, um, my heart rate variability on a good day would, would be, I'm just kind of pulling numbers out, but it might be eight to 10. So there, clearly there are several studies that have looked cross-sectionally at changes in heart rate variability with age, and there is a decline. But my point is, is that if we, if we did this study longitudinally within an individual, we would also see a normal decline in healthy populations. But the ranges vary. So if we took a cross-section of 30-year-olds um, who are in good health 
And we would still find some ranges there, for example, height. One of the differences um, that is uh, related to height is, is the, the blood pressure. And, and so there are changes that have to do with height, all things equal because of the, the pumping action the, the, uh, of gravity. You have to oppose gravity in a taller person. And so those, those also have subtle effects. But there are ranges and there are publications uh, in normal healthy controls, college uh, students, as well as um, uh, young adult populations. And so those, those variables are known. And, and the ranges are, I mean, they're fairly wide and you could still be considered normal. So the way that it's done in the clinic is there's typically, it's not so much the rate where you fall in the range, but if you exceed a certain cutoff. And so if you're, if a cutoff for one of the measures, and I'll, I'll throw this out there without being too technical, but SDNN, which is the standard deviation of normal to normal pulses or IBIs, if your SDNN is measured to be less than 50 in a heart rate monitor, an overnight heart rate monitor, it's generally thought that there's something wrong. Whether you're 30 years old or whether you're 60 years old, if you go below the cutoff, that means that this heart is not likely to be healthy. So there are ranges for normal function. They're fairly wide. And then there are cutoffs beyond which it's thought, and it, it, it does appear to be true, that it can discriminate between healthy and not healthy individuals. Fascinating. Do you, do you have a, a sense if um, sleep apnea plays into uh, the effects of heart rate variability or how heart rate variability shows up? It does. Absolutely. A apnea is uh, clearly uh, has uh, impacts. And if honestly, if I had a patient in the clinic who said to me, I have apnea, you know, at the start, I would really recommend and encourage them to seek treatment for their apnea before we did any heart rate variability. It, it's going to override. So you cannot treat or you ought not try to treat apnea with a heart rate variability biofeedback intervention. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. a separate condition, right? So it's limited. It is, you know, it, it doesn't, it, it's a very powerful um, tool, uh, but there's some uh, conditions. I wouldn't take on a cardiac patient. Uh, with heart rate variability biofeedback. Yeah, makes sense. Interesting. So as far as measuring, uh, you're probably, I know you're familiar. There's a lot of uh, technology out there like wrist top heart rate monitors, uh, which I have when uh, I go out for an activity. And once I hit stop, it pops up a number that says HRE 42. What is that telling me? I have no idea what, <laughs> what a, I have no idea what a, what a, a, a wrist, what's called a wearable, uh, yeah. what index they would be using for heart rate variability. And, and so there's a warning there that, um, you know, these are generally they're proprietary and people, we, you know, we've certainly looked at wearables and tried to use them and, and uh, you, you can't really, they're not that useful for a uh, clinical type of measures where you need to have uh, really the IBIs per se. You, you need to be able to analyze the IBIs. I don't know what software algorithms are built into different uh, wearables to produce what they call an HRV. And some of them might be, you know, standard uh, legitimate type of uh, transformations, but some of them might not be. And without some real clear guidance on what on earth a 42 means, I, <laughs> I would not venture to say. So yeah. I don't know how they're measuring, what they mean by that. And a lot of times, a lot of the systems, not just wearables, but even a little more hefty systems, uh, they don't so much report the numbers as they do like colors or ranges. And so if you're in the green range, it sort of fits some predetermined, like I was saying, a normal, healthy range, you know, normative value. And so you get a green, but it doesn't tell you what the, the value is. And it doesn't even tell you which of the many variables it's basing that classification on. So while you can do home monitoring easily of heart rate variability, um, the, the risk uh, monitors are and, and those things, um, they're, they're not going to give you a really full picture of, of heart rate variability. Now, what, he, what it is useful for is comp comparisons within an individual. So if one day your, your wristband says 42 and then another day it says 16, 
you know, that's telling you something. It's telling you that there's some changes in whatever it is it's measuring. It, it all comes down to, to pulses. And, and the, the fundamental foundational data are pulses. They're IBIs. And so if you're recording devices measuring IBIs, somehow, some way in there, you can get a heart rate variability out of that. Uh, but there are a lot of different ways to do that. And it's hard to say which different devices are doing what. Okay. Thank you for explaining that. Mm -hmm. Important, I think, to call out that it's a good, like you said, a good guide to compare your personal day-to-day, -day, but may not right. give you that full picture. So it's not really a medical measuring device, more of a guide. That's right. And um, it gets even very uh, complex where some of these proprietary things will go on and they'll, they'll report to you what your stress level is and they'll report to you all sorts of things. And some of that might just be extensions. You know, it, it might just be sort of this is this is what we think, and it seems reasonable. Might not be so validated, right. but um, it gets very elaborate. So I, I encourage people to use. I, mean, I think it's great to use the Fitbits and and the different things, the different pulse monitors for recording your own device, sort of looking at your own stability, your own consistency across time. But it's not useful for comparing to other people or groups or, or anything like that. Perfect. Thank you. So we've talked about what heart rate is, what heart rate variability is. How does that translate into how we feel and perform? Oh, it, it's crucial, really. It is so central to well-being. Um, heart rate variability clinically was recognized in the, in the 60s or 70s as being a very, very strong and is still considered the strongest predictor of heart attack. But what we're saying there is, is that if it's a pathological heart rate variability, then it tells you something's wrong. If you're in the normal range, then it is uh, useful and is applied <clears throat> in optimum performance, in coaching, in training, as well as in executive functions, cognitive attention uh, can be shown uh, under uh, controlled conditions to decrease when heart rate variability is um, out of range and to be restored when heart rate variability is within range. It creates the, the, the idea is when you get this physiological coherence of heart rate, respiration, and blood pressure that I'm describing here, when you sort of hit that sweet spot of breathing, you achieve a whole body systemic physiological integration or synchronization. So now with each breath, your heart rate is synchronized with that. Those little changes in acceleration, deceleration become synchronized with the actual respiratory cycle itself. And so does the, um, the blood pressure waves that are emanating from central nervous system, opening and closing capillaries and vasculature. And you achieve this physiological condition of coherence in which you are optimum for thinking and memory skills and providing yourself with um, the ability to respond to challenges and functional challenges, everyday challenges. Now, we have to, it always comes up, you, you can't breathe slowly, you can't do the six breaths per minute, which is for, uh, about the ideal sweet spot for most people. You can't do the six breaths per minute while you're on a soccer field or in, in a lot of everyday challenges. You can't do that resonance frequency breathing. But with enough practice when you're at the computer or you're on the bus or you're doing something which is essentially um, restful. And if you can, the, the more that you practice, the more that you achieve this coherence, the easier it is to shift into it when there is a stress challenge. So if you're familiar with heart rate variability and the management of it, you know going into, whether it's going into a test or a job interview or, or some kind of physical challenge, you can prepare yourself both mentally and physically then through this very simple and yet very, very effective means of controlling your physiological status. So it's, it's uh, you know, there, the idea of coherence is associated with uh, emotional regulation, with um, uh, thinking and memory, response time, uh, any number of good things. I mean, it's, it's not like it builds up your muscles, but it does, it gives you the the cognitive ability, the perceptive ability then to meet challenges in an 
optimal fashion. And that's the key word. You know, we're not, I've got a limit, no matter how much I practice it, I'm, I'm not going to go beyond whatever my physiological range is. But if, if I manage my heart rate variability, I can optimize what my level of function is and what my adaptation is. That's the beauty of it. Yeah. Beautiful. You know, we, we talk a lot about um, activating our parasympathetic nervous system uh -huh. through breath control. So uh -huh. if I'm understanding this correctly, we've got, you know, the autonomic nervous system, which consists of the, uh, the sympathetic and parasympathetic uh -huh. and sympathetic fight or flight. So when we get uh -huh. scared, nervous, our heart rate may go up a little bit or go up drastically. And uh -huh. to bring that, bring us back into that, that calm, restful state, that's uh -huh. dropping into parasympathetic or activating parasympathetic. Right and we do that with breath. Right. With the exhalation, yeah. with the exhalation arm by slowing it down. That's right. So you get full credit for that answer. That was, that was exact. <laughs> that is exactly right. Um, in the, you know, in our fundamental state in our pre evolution pre pre mammalian state, we didn't have the parasympathetic nervous system working in the same way. We essentially only had fight or flight and everything, you know, any kind of stress or challenge in the environment uh, would produce immediate acceleration and fight or flight. But as, as we've evolved, we, have elaborated the vagal system, which controls parasympathetic. And so we now have this uh, supra or uber um, control system from central nervous system, from cranial nerves, which tells us that we can rest and digest, which is the flip side. You know, the, in, in simple terms, um, sympathetic is fight or flight and parasympathetic is rest and digest. It's an oversimplification. And so I don't want you to think that's all there is to it, but Yes, parasympathetic com means you're in a restful state or relaxed state, and the heart will slow down. So by bumping up, so to speak, or exercising the parasympathetic arm of the autonomic nervous system interplay between, sym between sympathetic and parasympathetic, by practicing that slow exhalation, you, you strengthen, so to speak, you strengthen that portion of the cycle. Now, remember, these things are pretty... Uh, they're fairly rapid. We're talking about a 10 second cycle where you can shift from sympathetic to parasympathetic. These are not the same kinds of shifts that you would have if you were faced with uh, uh, cold weather or if you were faced with uh, a threat, you know, a real serious threat or a serious stress. But the idea is, is that by um, practicing the, um, the heart rate variability biofeedback, you're strengthening your ability to shift into that parasympathetic mode and it becomes easier and easier. Another way to think about it is on the flip side, if you are not doing regular uh, breath control, everyone because of the challenges of life tends to exist in a hyper arousal over sympathetic state. We sort of live from day to day and, and moment to moment with slightly accelerated heart rates with, you know, uh, psychological stress and pressures and, and racing brain and, and all of those things that are hard to achieve without conscious control. Mm -hmm. And that's just, a, so what we say is, is that we're born with a system, a parasympathetic system that operates normally. So if you look at youngsters before, you know, they begin to experience real serious stress, many of them find, have no difficulty in relaxing in there. It's a normal, natural state. And we learn how to become sympathetically overdriven. And so a lot of what we do in the clinic is try to unlearn and, and re return to a more basic state where we are better adapted to dealing with stresses in the environment. We have better control over our physiology. Makes sense. Yeah. Controlled environment. All right. So now that we've set up what it is and why heart rate variability is so important you know, in your experience, in, the, in your different roles, and maybe particularly with the VA, how, how can we use HRV to manage pain, post-traumatic stress, or even chronic stress? Well, first of all, let me say you can. Um, it is an effective adjunctive intervention for pain, for chronic or sensitized pain, uh, as well as for PTSD, stress-related. It, it's very, it's been proven uh, to have uh, significant symptom effects and depression as well, anxiety, stress, things that are sort of between normal stress and clinical conditions. It, it does work. Um, 
So that's the fundamental importance of it. Uh, it's the sort of thing that seems so simple, it kind of is gimmicky. And initially, many people are turned off by it because they think, well, it, it, you know, you're, you're sort of kidding me. But a clinical psychologist would know from the get-go that diaphragmatic breathing is helpful for about two-thirds of the patients that you see where anxiety is a factor or stress-related disorders are a factor. Diaphragmatic breathing is the foundation then of controlling heart rate variability and is the message that we want to bring to anyone who comes in the clinic who's exhibiting either uh, overt anxiety or pain or um, uh, irregular breathing. I mean, you can sort of, you can visualize in many cases that people have just simply, they don't breathe right. They chest breathe they breathe irregularly or they breathe rapidly and don't understand that you can actually get a calming, emotional calming effect through controlled, slow breathing, slow, deep breathing. And so that's a message that, that we really, without even talking about whatever issues there might be. And it just as it's as simple a matter as people saying, take a deep breath, you know, calm down. It's really true. It's not much more complex than that at the outset, although it, it's much more elaborated and there's much more uh, data that can be had, but at the nub of it, if you slow deep breathe, when you're under stress, when you're upset or anxious or emotional, you will get uh, this, this relaxation effect. It will, it it's puts you into a physiological state of coherence where blood pressure, heart rate and respiration are all synchronized and you can think more clearly. So it is, it is an intervention in and of itself apart from in addition to uh, whatever psychotherapies you might be doing or physical therapies you might be doing. It's sort of giving you top-down control, which then, as I said, it optimizes your ability to function. And whether that's continuing to face a stress or whether that's to eliminate a stress or whatever it is, it optimizes moment-to-moment -moment function and adaptation to the environment. So we can use breath for an almost instantaneous state change when Absolutely. we're feeling distracted, maybe, you know, the, the Buddhist term monkey mind, um, stressful, um, anxiety. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's right. Racing brain is what I've, it, it, the, I like that, that monkey, up there, but um, racing brain is, it, you'll see that sort of in the literature there mm -hmm. that it, it, it tackles racing brain that's associated with anxiety and chronic pain and, and other things. And it, it is definitely effective for relieving, uh, at least at the moment, uh, the racing brain. The more you practice, the easier it is to shift into. This episode of Fierce Planet Adventures podcast is brought to you by Five Mountain Coaching. Licensed, unbeatable mind coaching. Integrated, accelerated vertical growth across five domains of cutting-edge development. Designed by retired Navy SEAL Commander Mark Devine. Learn the big four skills of mental toughness and resiliency. Discover the six pillars of performance. Test your mettle with custom-created crucibles across all five domains. Visit FiveMountainCoaching.com to schedule your free one-hour unbeatable mind coaching session. That's the number five, mountaincoaching.com. Begin your journey to becoming unbeatable today. Something we can call upon very easily. I mean, we all we all breathe. Right. We just have to teach ourselves right. to do it correctly. Well, look, you know, a, a shortstop is going to be doing this in between plays. Mm -hmm. You know, he's going to kind of calm himself down. It's that rapid. And so it's very effective on in sports. That's why it's effective in sports. Is, you know, it's teaching people to think clearly and whatever the the physical challenge is not just where there are clinical issues involved. Wonderful. Um, so as it relates to post-traumatic stress, when you work with the, the, your past work with the VA, how, how does that come into play? You know, I mean, I, I can, I can assume make assumptions here, but I'd rather hear like to the veteran right. who, who's, who's, who's suffering right now. Well, here's what I would, I would advise. Um, you can find this in the VA in kind of an institutional format, but this is something that can be done on your own. And if you're a veteran and you're being treated for PTSD by any one of a number of approved, of which heart rate variability has not reached a level of being a clinically driven uh, offering or part of the clinical menu in most, in many VAs. Okay. Some VAs do offer it. And, and there, you know, it's a good thing, but at, for all veterans, it is something that is self-empowerment and it can be done independent of a practitioner or a provider. However, I think the best uh, way to get this heart rate variability 
control, this breath control is with a coach, is with a trained and qualified coach. Mm-hmm. And you can find coaches in the VA and you can find coaches outside of the VA. And so you can, or you can just do it yourself. Some veterans have showed remarkable facility in picking up the skill. The, the biofeedback we're talking about, this controlled skill, which includes the emotion regulation and mindfulness, um, can be taught or trained and, and there are levels of certification of trainers and, and some people can just do it themselves. But for many cases, it really takes the guidance of a coach. So if you find a coach, uh, either within the VA or outside of the VA or on your own, these are all ways to reach this level of coherence. So for my work, what I found was that people who sort of got it, it, it I want to say independent of what the... Uh, the clinical menu was, they would incorporate, you can incorporate that into a therapy session easily. If you have a 45 minute therapy session for PTSD, where you're going to practice, let's say, you know, the VA likes uh, what they called um, CPT, cognitive processing therapy, Mm -hmm. which is an updated, modernized version of RBT. And RBT goes back to the 60s and 70s. That's a very well-established psychotherapy. But it's, it's effective for PTSD, and the VA offers it to many, many people. Uh, a CPT therapist or a prolonged exposure therapist may do a little bit of heart rate variability biofeedback for the first 10 minutes in order to enhance receptivity of a veteran who, or the individual who is struggling with these um, uh, obsessive thoughts and, or with the, uh, the triggers and you know, the, the PTSD is a very difficult heterogeneous disorder with many, many, many different kinds of symptoms and different constellations of symptoms. And so the presentation can vary depending on one, one veteran might be just killed by nightmares and another by a uh, startle reaction or irritation or something else. And so the presentations do vary, but regardless of which flavor of PTSD you have, a, a brief session of heart rate variability it increases that receptivity. It sort of enhances your emotion control. It enhances your attention focusing, and it enhances your physiological state, calms you down, puts you into a much more receptive state. So it dovetails perfectly with a number of other top-down type of therapies for PTSD. Um, it, it would, you know, if, if you're taking medication, let's take your, say you're taking sertraline from your VA provider. Well, that's fine. There's no contraindication for doing uh, heart rate variability biofeedback in addition to that. So it is adjunctive to many, many uh, interventions for PTSD. And it is also a standalone in some cases for some individuals with uh, acquisition of the skill of heart rate variability biofeedback and practice over long term will achieve lasting symptom improvement. Outside of you know, the, the indications or the, the issues we already talked about, like somebody having heart disease or sleep apnea, is there a situation where um, HRV would not be appropriate? Well, j- those that you mentioned, uh, there are certain disorders. And uh, honestly, even for PTSD, I've seen individuals who were just were not ready for heart rate variability. So a danger that I've noticed is many practitioners tend to promote it as a panacea you know, a single agent treatment for all manner of disorders. And, and I don't think that's right. I think a little bit more uh, care. So in any case where there is um, notable breathing irregularities and notable but reversible uh, low heart rate variability. So I think the issue is reversibility of, of a disorder. So, you know, it, is it helpful for dementia? It, it Yes, what it does is it provides a certain level of basic comfort, and it's widely used in in, uh, in that setting for a lot of uh, cognitive aging disorders. Uh, but it's it's relatively, uh, I want to say, um, you know, it, it's not. Th- these are not giant changes in the individual, but it does provide a certain level of of useful uh, improvement in function. But it will not stop or reverse uh, dementia or any one of a number of other uh, disorders, which, and, and so there's some treatments, listen, I'd tell you, the first thing I'd tell you is, you know, go get some kind of painkiller for certain types of pain, mm-hmm. but you should also have heart rate variability in addition to prevent the sensitization. It's adjunctive to everything. 
and it is standalone for some conditions. Where do we go from here? You know, how, how can somebody or can somebody, I think we've answered this, but improving your heart rate variability, obviously the practice of breath, like we've discussed, but are there any other factors that yes. someone can influence? Yes. Yeah. The two others are the attention focusing. I, I go with the, um, and, and I'm not the only one and they're different mixtures of this, but my particular concoction is what I call autonomic self-regulation. And there are three essential components of autonomic self-regulation. One is slow, deep breathing. And that's what we've talked about, the resonance frequency. The other two, uh, one is uh, mindfulness, which is uh, focused attention. And we advise people because it is a physiological um, intervention itself. I mean, you're directly intervening on the heart that you focus that mindfulness onto your heart, onto your heart rate, onto your breath. Now, again, mindfulness quite often you know, there are any number of things that mindfulness can be directed to as long as it's momentary and there's non-judgmental and you're just heightening your awareness. But for this autonomic self-regulation, it's most useful to focus then on the passage of air, the intake and the exhalation of air and effects on your heart. And then the third component, we have uh, slow, deep breathing and we have mindfulness. The third is the emotion regulation. And emotion regulation is a top-down process, and it's not really different from rational therapy, but it's a way of managing your thoughts and feelings. Emotion regulation is, is a standalone psycho, psychotherapy. Many people go in for the, the top-down type of therapies for depression, for anxiety, for stress, for you know, uh, marriage counseling, uh, any number of... Um, psychological disorders that are reversible and that are treatable. And so we practice emotion regulation. So the coach is, has, let's say a 30 minute or 45 minute is a typical heart rate variability biofeedback. The coach is observing your breathing and the coach is advising you, you know, can you sense your heart? Can you feel the breath coming? You're getting a feedback from the computer screen, which is showing you what your heart rate variability is, showing what your respiration patterns are. So you're getting that feedback and you're becoming aware of it and you're consciously trying to link up the experience of the heart rate variability coherence with the experience of the mindfulness and then the emotion regulation. And so you're practicing bringing the uh, top-down control of thoughts and feelings along with awareness of your heart and breathing, along with actual literal physical controlled slow breathing. That, that's, as, that's effective. And so that's what I call autonomic self-regulation. That's what I'll be presenting in Dallas uh, so where we go from here is, is, is guys like me and guys like you and, and Casey, uh, <laughs> ladies like yourself, um, to, to promote it, just to bring more and more awareness that it's not fringy. It is, it is not um, pseudoscience. It's not, you know, it, unfortunately, it suffers from the uh, apparent simplicity of it that makes it dismissible, but it's also not a panacea in all cases either. So it's just having an objective, clear picture, what it is, how to do it, and how it works. The more people who can do that, whether they are clinically disordered or whether they are looking for improvements in day-to-day -day, uh, adaptation, or whether they are elite athletes attempting to, to break a record and be involved in some kind of optimal performance, same as there are studies of musicians using heart rate variability to improve performance. It, you know, it's a test taking strategy. The more people that become aware of it, the better. Now there, there's a willing population out there already. And lots of people you can, you know, there's a booming market for heart rate variability devices and trainings, but it is best, I think, to have a qualified professional either show you how, or at least limit yourself to, to what is really validated, legitimate, you know, as scientific proven uh, approaches. Would this be a good time to, to talk, start to begin talking about uh, biofeedback and going a little bit deeper into resonance breathing? Yes, of course. Of course. Um, this can be done. I mean, it, you know, it, it's not dissimilar from what we think of as uh, ancient and Eastern medical practices, but in those 
uh, in those practices, there, were, there was no technology involved. It was something that people understood without having to uh, quantify it or without having to have any kind of assistive devices. And, and it's, it's still true that people can learn uh, uh, autonomic self-regulation. They can learn it themselves, just come to it, or you can acquire it um, from reading or from training yourself. But to really be efficient for someone in a clinic, it requires, I believe, I would say, the uh, a qualified coach and uh, some simple and easily obtainable devices. And the devices are software, a sensor, and a computer screen. And some of these software applications are on, on phones. I mean, Casey, in between your Fitbit and a laptop type of system, you know, they're phone apps. And these phone apps can have sensors that attach to either earlobe or fingertip that will sense the pulse. And right there is a key difference between the Fitbit and uh, any of these other devices is the way that they're sensing the heart rate. And you're getting a much um, closer count of, of the pulses when you act, you know when you're sensing directly uh, fingertip or earlobe than on the wrist with a, a watch. So the recording is, is really a little bit better. But if you have a simple sensor that is then um, sending information, sending the signals, the heart rate signals into a software program on a laptop, which can then generate feedback um, screens. And these feedback screens are either graphs and displays their numeric quantifications of heart rate, respiration. And you can even measure blood pressure while you're doing it. That's a little more advanced, but um, for a simple home system, um, a fingertip sensor with the right kind of software and a laptop will give you what you need. And then a coach kind of helping you through it until you can create the right kind of visual quantitative patterns of heart rate and respiration. And the more you do that, and it takes a little bit of practice for some people, the easier it becomes to translate, to transition to creating that state without the feedback. So the idea is to acquire the skill of regulating physiology of heart rate and a respiration through feedback until you begin to understand what it feels like, what the state is. That's the feedback part of it. But ultimately, people who practice enough can do this without the benefit of the biofeedback screen. So you're not dependent on it. It is a skill acquisition. And once you acquire the skill using those three elements of slow, deep breathing, mindfulness, and emotion regulation, you can do it anytime, anywhere, sitting at your desk and on the bus and so on and so forth. And you no longer need the biofeedback. So, you know, it's a little bit confusing. We don't want to say people need to always be doing heart rate variability biofeedback because you don't always need to have the visual feedback from the software that is transforming the signals of your heart rate into visual displays. So it's almost like it's giving you that intrinsic view of what's mm -hmm. happening. Yeah. That's right. So. And it, it's like muscle memory in a way, you know, if, you, if you're getting a golf swing or you're getting a tennis swing and you, you get it right and then you keep practicing it, you keep grooving it, it then becomes non-conscious. Heart rate variability, is, I, I think always will have, and I haven't really thought about it much, but I think there's always going to be kind of a, a conscious aspect to heart rate variability. So it's not really a muscle memory since, you know, Cerebral cortex is not a muscle, but it, it's something that you practice and that you, you, can, you can become aware of. So we were talking about how to, how to promote this, right? And where do we go from here? Right. And, and I think, you know, just heightening awareness through, through podcasts like this and uh, spreading the word. Um, you know, there are strong movements afoot now, and I'm a part of some groups where the idea is to go completely upstream and teach heart rate variability biofeedback in medical school as an intervention. I mean, you can see that the sense of the sense of that. Um, there's not much we can do in the open market in the open commercial market if people want to 
learn it they can and you know it's free choice mm -hmm. but for for a, a professional whether they're a biofeedback trained professional or a psychotherapist professional or a medical professional it is something which the, the more you do it the more it is i've known physicians in an oncology clinic who is determined to set up a program whereby he could write a prescription for heart rate variability biofeedback to one of to to his patients which would then enable them to get uh, insurance reimbursement for the equipment, for the software, for the sensors, and for the laptop. But, you know, I'm really talking, it's less than $300. It's about $250 for a very, very um, respectable piece of equipment, not counting the computer, but for the <laughs> software and the sensors. And, and and that would be then self, you know, you you just learn it yourself. Yeah. But the more widespread it is, you know, the healthier the population. There are people, there are people in public health sectors who want to see heart rate variability biofeedback become a part of health promotion and it should be i mean it's a part of all sorts of health and wellness coaching yes that sort of bigger picture to uh, the mental health crisis going on mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. teaching people how to be able to integrate mm -hmm. that that word really stuck out before you used mm -hmm. um being able to integrate your emotions better Yep. Is, it's it's, it's is, necessary. It's necessary. Yes. If all you do is breathe right, I don't think you've achieved whole health. Yeah. And and so, you know, emotion regulation, and, and I've had this argument many times about whether emotion regulation is, you know, essential for uh, coherence. And my answer is it's essential for whole health. And so while you, you may achieve physiological, and, and, and I think there's some evidence that you actually do a, have a higher level ultimately, uh, but you have to have the emotion regulation for full adaptation to the environment. So, you know, not only do you have to breathe right, but you have to think right too and feel right. Would you feel comfortable walking us through what uh, a 60 second resonance breathing pattern would be? Or is that something that? Well, I, I'm interested. You know what I would like to do if it was possible would be to show you some screenshots. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you could... Um, I'm not sure I, I even, ha I, I have lots of screenshots of heart rate variability of the effects of, of changes mm -hmm. due to heart rate variability biofeedback. And that's very compelling. So if, if we want to do a, a screen share, yeah. um, I'll, I can show you what, what happens and, and how it goes it, really, really sophisticated. And I've seen this done in meetings, a good uh, uh, biofeedback professional can take someone out of the audience hook them up, have an overhead or a, you know, a, a display screen and be showing the audience the, the feedback, the visual feedback of heart rate and respiration, and then begin the coaching and begin the training. And after about 15 minutes, you can actually see the pattern shift, you know, real time in real time. Wow. And I'm, okay. I'm not set up to do that, but I can, you know, I can show you what happens uh, mm -hmm. from in a number of different uh, visual displays. Now, this is a a talk from way back when and it's got a lot of eclectic stuff in there so we don't have to look at it. but i want to go to a couple of this is all about heart rate variability and that's that's how you look at heart rate variability this is that point about ibis and how you can have 60 beats per minute one second each or this little change you know 0 0.9 1.0 1.1 have the variability and this the parasympathetic and you know there's there's just a lot of stuff here but to show you the way it looks, um, this is telling you, this is a real um, output. This is a very healthy uh, trace of heart rate, which corresponds, see this little, I can't quite increase, but this right here, that's a peak. That's a 0.1 peak. That means your heart is functioning in exactly the right range of frequency of up and down of IBIs. And you can see this, You this is, is real time during a coaching session. You can have your your client create a, a 0.1 hertz peak right in front of you once they get their breathing under control. Because this, this is telling you that your heart rate, your respiration, and your blood pressure are synchronized. You don't get this peak unless that happens. So here's what, the way it looks in, um, in, in a real case, you know, and it's real subject data. Um, it's all about breathing and, and uh, control and uh, lungs and stuff like that. Uh, co uh, there's the resonance frequency. Uh, I'm sure it's here somewhere. This is the setup. 
this is a setup for heart rate variability. You have this person here is wearing a, a monitor or a sensor. This person here is looking at a coach's screen. This person here is looking at the subject screen. This has the visual feedback. It may either be graphic quantitative or it may be animations. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I was telling you that, that some feedbacks will just give you a color. Some will actually, you know, the balloon will float and the, the flowers will blossom. And all what it's doing there is, is taking recordings of your heart rate. It's looking for that 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 sign change or that up and down that acceleration deceleration of heart over respiratory cycles and when you hit it it'll start giving you graphics but those graphics are based on the input signals of heart rate or ibi and when you achieve a profile of ibis that is consistent with respiration and with breathing uh, with with respiration uh, and heart rate changes then you get the flowers. And so you could people, you know, the veterans generally preferred the, the quantitative, but a lot of subjects or biofeedback people uh, will get different screens that tell them not so much what the numbers are, but if they're in the right range. Hmm. So there's, you know, there's the, the, the component. There we go. This is what I wanted to show you. This here, and um, this is a pre, this is a veteran pre um, heart rate variability biofeedback. This is his heart trace, his heart rate trace. These are IBIs over time, over seconds. And this is measuring, RR is a measure in, in uh, microseconds of IBIs. Now remember a thousand microseconds is one second. So when you're around an IBI of a thousand microseconds, you're at a heart rate of 60 beats per minute because that's one second in between. And so this one here is ranging between, um, oh, this one actually has been converted to beats per minute. Okay, fine. So he's ranging between, looks like, it's a little hard for me to read that. Uh, I'm going to say between, I think it's 50 and 70. I'm not sure. Um, but not over each cycle. You see, he, he has what's called non-stationarity. So for this particular time, his minimum is here, his maximum is here. At this point, his minimum is here, his maximum is here. But the change from max to min over a cycle is approximately the same. So he's not really getting any, any benefits of the acceleration, deceleration of heart rate that comes with breathing. In other words, he's not breathing. He's not slow, deep breathing. He has a little bit of a, of a normal trace, but it's just not, it's not booming, so to speak. After the training, you see that his, his baseline here, the minimum is pretty solid. And now the, the amplitude of these waves is much larger. Yeah. So here he's going from a baseline of whatever it is. He's probably increased his heart rate variability on a, on a single cycle. He's probably gone from about, I'm going to say eight, up to about 12 or 15 from max to min. Okay. Now, in, the, in this case, let me just finish, if you don't mind. In this case here, he's got, and this is just a blow, this is a little more sophisticated equipment. Here, um, he's way down here. This is your thousand uh, uh, microseconds here. So this is around a heartbeat of around 60. And this is just kind of trash. He's, he's getting the... Uh, equipment going. But here you have these little tiny amplitude, very, very small. He's probably not changing more than five beats per minute over a cycle. Here, after the training, it's all gotten focused right here. This is six breaths per minute. This is what happens to your heart rate variability when you're breathing. So let me just emphasize that this here, this is seconds, this is frequency. So this frequency here is the six breaths per minute. This is seconds, this is frequency. And it's this transformation from heart rate in seconds to heart rate variability at a certain frequency, which mm -hmm. tells you you're on track. So here, this is just the frequency, this is the equivalent. These two slides are the equivalent of these two graphs. So I know from this that his, his tachygram would be very small and choppy. And I know from this that his tachygram, those waves 
over each cycle would be large. The amplitudes would be large. And he's probably changing 10 or 12 beats per minute over a cycle. Did, did I get through it? Did I, do you see what I'm saying? Absolutely. That's, okay. that's fascinating. And, and I think it's amazing because with, like we said before, just the simple act of being conscious in breathing deep, slow breaths, diaphragmatic breathing can change your physiology that quickly. Correct. That's right. It will. It will. And then the other has to come along. I mean, you, you have to bring along the mindfulness and the um, uh, motion regulation to produce whole health. Wow. Amazing. Um, is, is there anything else? I'm, I'm asking this in this fashion because I'm just not sure. I don't know what I don't know. Is there anything else that, that people should know about this process in case you, you know, if you've got other questions by all means. Well, you know, if I, if I was beginning to, to work in this area, I think the first thing that I would do when I encounter someone is say, how much do you already know about it? You know, what, what do you think? Have you heard about it? What do you know? It, it's deceptive because it seems simple. It seems gimmicky and people sort of promoted as being, oh, you don't need, to. it's really very, very, very complex. And so people are going to be at different levels of knowledge and skill. So you'd want to leverage wherever they're at to go further. If they already know about it, you don't really need to do much to, to advance them, except encourage them and say it's really good. But if someone comes to you with disordered breathing and a lot of stress and they they don't know what to do, they're confused. First thing to do is have a conversation about heart rate variability, biofeedback. What do you understand? You know, what do you, you heard about it? What's your, what's his, what do you think about it? And, and kind of have a conversation like that. And you could do this in clinic, out of clinic, just anywhere, just to promote it. That's, and there are meetings, you know, um, I'm going to a meeting in Dallas in March and almost everybody there is going to be expert in heart rate variability biofeedback. So we, we congregate, you know, from, from time to time. And you can see how it's grown. You can see how, how much, you know, momentum it's beginning to build. So I would just increase awareness uh, that it's real, it's effective. It needs to be legitimized to a greater degree than it is as a valid medical practice and shake off the stigma that comes with it being simple, with it being sort of Eastern and therefore maybe just kind of, you know, fuzzy stuff that's nothing, but which is, it's not. I mean, it, it's deeply rooted and it now it's rooted in science and physiology. And that's what's new and exciting about it. Brilliant. You know, and I think with all the advances in science and what we've come to learn, um, it's really validating a lot of what Eastern philosophy, Eastern medicine has, has been using for centuries. So to me, that that's very validating. It's very exciting. Great. Listen, I know our time's up, but I'm going to finish with this. If you don't mind, mm -hmm. I've gotten very interested and excited in, in what's called phytoncides. They're also called, um, um, Volatile organic chemicals that, that plants, that trees give off. Mm -hmm. uh, forest bathing, you might have heard yes. of that. Tree bathing, that's for real too. And, and I'm, I'm sort of making this link between, I'm working on making this link between phytoncides or forest bathing and heart rate variability as, as kind of a natural. So my point being that there are many roads that all lead to the same place. And so, you know, you just one foot in front of the other. And if you're on the right road and you go in the right direction, that's where you'll wind up. Remain curious and open-minded. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Jack, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us on heart rate variability. Uh, this is, I, I love this topic and it's, it's something that I think we're both going to dive into. We've had, we've had anecdotal su success with coaching clients, you know, using um, breathing techniques to um, bring down um, their state of arousal. And it's a uh -huh. great place to start, you know, with, with a coaching client because, uh -huh. you know, it helps them kind of just settle down and, and be able to be present where they're at. So thank you so much. Friends, if you found the Fierce Planet Adventures podcast helpful, please consider leaving a five-star review on iTunes or your podcast platform of choice. It helps others find our podcast. If you screenshot your review and tag us on Instagram, we'll send you a classic Fierce Planet Adventures sticker for your water bottle, cooler, car, 
send us a direct message uh, with your mailing address on Instagram, and we'll send you that sticker right out. Thanks for joining us and live fiercely.